Hi everybody, this is T. Falcon Napier. Welcome to the third part of Lesson 7. Joining me as always, Dave Miller. Say hi, Dave. Hello, everyone. So we have been talking about how to go about managing productive tension for the past couple of weeks. Uh, we refer to these as change grid maneuvers. And as one of our faculty members pointed out, this is kind of what's central to coaching uh, as, a, as, a, as a behavior or as a profession anyway. How do you go about managing someone's level of tension? How do you go about impacting their attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors to help them to accomplish whatever it is they set out to accomplish? So. Today we're going to be finishing that up with the last of the five sets of change grid maneuvers. But let's do a very quick review just to uh, get everybody up to uh, speed. So we talked about the five different kinds of change grid maneuvers, down grid maneuvers, up grid maneuvers, out grid, in grid, and today we'll be talking about PowerPoint. So as a quick reminder, down grid maneuvers were used to lower someone's level of productive tension, to move them from wherever they started off on the change grid to any place lower down. The more of these downgrid maneuvers I do, the lower and lower you go on the change grid. Uh, downgrid maneuvers were based um, uh, on four uh, different sets of things you could do. So normalize, simplify, restore resources, and add resources. You do any one or a combination of these four things and someone's level of tension is going to go down. Um, similarly, if they have too little tension uh, and you feel there's a benefit to raising their level of productive tension, uh, you can do that by using the upgrade maneuvers. So the upgrade maneuvers were increase standards, change tasks, awaken emotions, boost accountability, and you would do one or a combination of these things to move their level of tension from wherever they started to someplace higher. The more of these you do, the further upgrade their level of tension is going to go. Now someone did bring up after our last lesson Lesson, uh, a, a question about purity and what they were uh, getting at is what happens if you do a little bit of, of the downgrade maneuvers and a little bit of the upgrade maneuvers well the truth is that if you do them in too rapid succession they can actually cancel one another out leaving the person exactly where they started from on the change grid and so we talked a little bit and we'll bring this up during the discussion sessions too, that let's say you've got someone who is in very much a crisis sort of a state. The first thing that we're going to want to do is lower their level of tension sufficiently uh, to get them out of that stress response, maybe even out of power stress where they're ready to take some immediate action because it just feels like that's still premature. There's that, that's their, their residual uh, stress still expressing itself, still talking. We go like, no, we need to move, to move them down to power where they start to think about other options, start to gather some sort of data. Well, you might actually say, no, I need them even lower. I need this person to go from being in a very reactive state to just mellowing out for a little while. And whether that little while is a few minutes or, a, or an hour, a day, a week, whatever, you might say, no, we got to just move them down to a place where they can really heal, they can recharge their batteries, whatever. And that tends to happen more in even power apathy and even down in apathy if they just need to, you know, take a real a real rest, I mean, go to sleep, uh, truly, truly uh, reduce your level of tension to a passive sort of state uh, for some period of time. Um, after you've done that, now you can say, well, now that I've got them uh, relaxed again, now there is work to do, there is an issue, and so you would move on to the upgrade maneuvers and now start talking about the specific tasks that need to be performed, increase some standards, boost some accountability, you know, get back to doing the work. But if I were to just in rapid succession, normalize and simplify and restore resources and then awaken their emotions and throw some standards, uh, some increased standards at them and uh, hit them with a little bit of accountability, I think I've just actually negated what I did and that would leave them in the exact same spot they started at. So we have to be very aware that everything that we say and do is having an impact on someone's level of productive tension. And so in particular, if it's about upgrade and downgrade, complete one set before you move on to the other set. Don't combine them or you will end up neutralizing. Thoughts about that? 
That makes sense. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Now, we also have, uh, uh, we we're talking about the in-grid and out-grid maneuvers. Upgrid and downgrid maneuvers were about managing someone's tension itself. Um, now, when we are doing out-grid maneuvers and in-grid maneuvers, this is more about managing their level of drive. So the intensity that they're about to do something at. So, I mean, everything is really tension management, uh, but uh, the, uh, so our primary focus is about moving them to whatever the ideal level of tension is. So let those be the primary change grid maneuvers are upgrid and downgrid. The secondary change grid maneuvers are about outgrid and ingrid. Uh, so this is about after we have worked with their level of productive tension, generally moving them into power. Now the question is, do we want to move them outgrid or ingrid? You could do outgrid and ingrid maneuvers with people that are further upgrid or are farther downgrid, but there's just not as much workspace. I mean, if you look at the shape of the change grid, as we move further um, and further upgrid or further and further downgrid, the range of possibilities in the ingrid and outgrid directions become more confined because that's the way a diamond shape works. So uh, there's just not a lot of room to work with in-grid and out-grid until we get someone into power, and then we have the full width of the change grid to work in. Now, it is very common for us to blend down-grid and out-grid maneuvers simultaneously. It's very common for us to blend upgrid and outgrid um, messages simultaneously. So let me flip back a little bit and, and tell you how that is. So let's say you've got someone I mean, who isn't into crisis, chaos, not, not the first scenario I described, but is just really upgrid about something. And that level of, of, uh, of tension isn't really serving them all that well. You might say, well, we need to lower their level of tension down to power so they become more open open to understanding options and exploring possibilities and getting ruled a little bit by, more by logic. Uh, but I do want to move them out grid. So let's, let's just kind of uh, revisit down grid. Down grid again, normalize, simplify, restore resources, add resources. You can probably hear yourself working with a client who's in an urgent sort of situation saying to them, well, before you jump into that, let's just stop for a moment and revisit what's been done. This could be about simplifying it, restoring resources. And then you may, within the next sentence or two, say, all right, well, now that we've kind of taken the edge off of that, let's uh, start talking about um, about the risk that's really involved here. Or, you know, start working with their belief system that uh, we talk about appealing to their ego, that they really matter, that they, they need to, uh, we need to use our leadership to inspire them to take on a leadership role themselves. So take that chance, you know, so let's lower their level of tension. Let's get those nerves out of the way. Let's let them know that we believe in them. And there's lots of reasons why they should believe in themselves, inspire them to move on to that, provide some of that performance coaching we talked about. So it's very common for us to move people down and out. And if you look at the screen for a second, you can see my little pointer here. Um, ultimately, um, this bears repeating many, many times. Remember that definitive change only occurs two places on the change grid. The first place that changes routinely occur, and I genu genuinely believe that the vast majority of changes that take place in people's lives are upgrid changes. Upgrid changes are dictated by some sort of external factor. So something outside of you is imposing itself upon your reality, demanding your attention, and requiring you to do something now. And so upgrid changes are very, very uh, uh, frequent in our lives. And it's just because outgrid things, or rather uh, external things, are telling us, well, you got to do this. So you got deadlines you got to meet. You got, um, uh, you know, bills to be paid. You've got uh, little windows of opportunity that you either do it or you lose it. And so there's lots of things that are happening upgrid, um, demands from other people, pressures from wh whoever. Lots of external things are imposing them, uh, themselves upon your reality reality, um, you know, all day long, every day. And so you adjust, you, you make concessions, you take actions. It's all very upgrade. Upgrade changes are driven by external factors. Now, 
in our role as coaches and human development professionals, um, we very frequently work with people who have spent so much of their life in a reactive or we'll even say a responsive sort of way that they have pushed their own goals, their own objectives, their own choices kind of to the back burner. By the end of the day, they run out of time, and what didn't they get around to taking care of? They didn't get around to taking care of themselves. And so we frequently are working with clients who are trying to take charge of their own life, trying to become you know, masters of their own destiny, captains of their own ship, whatever metaphor you want to throw in there. Uh, and that's really about encouraging people to move out grid. We talked about people being very intentional as they move out grid, and then going from intention to execution, or rather to engage and then from engagement to execution, this is something that we very frequently are encouraging our clients and supporting them as they uh, move in these outgrid directions to uh, get to exactly what they're going for. Outgrid changes are driven by internal factors, by, by choice and uh, by um, this deliberate sort of mind and and all the things that come along with that. So uh, it's interesting how often we work with people who have been in a reactive change mode. Again, you should hear that as an upgrid uh, change um, uh, region to an outgrid change region, moving from being externally driven to internally driven, from responding to others to responding to self. So, uh, you know, so I, I think, you know, and I could say that umpteen different ways, but you guys get the idea. We very frequently move people down grid and out grid, and those maneuvers can be done sequentially if you feel so inclined, but you could also blend them with great impact. Thoughts about that? Questions, comments? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, another one I was thinking about is just when you apply the training, because mm -hmm. um, it seems like what you're doing is you're, you're providing resource, but you're also increasing um, someone's confidence, someone's ability, and I think mm -hmm. that naturally moves someone down and out. Yeah, you right. Yeah, and so certainly in, in the world of being a trainer, you are equipping people. So we always say that the job of a trainer is to teach you things you don't already know and give you skills you don't already have. So, uh, and then whatever you do have, it's often about uh, refreshing those things. Uh, re, well, we say restoring those resources, but exercising again. So yeah, you did it long ago. You could always be able to do this, but it's gotten rusty. So let's polish it up again. Let's, let's, let's move it forward. And then that's uh, the uh, good training is also said the reason why this training is being given is in order to equip you to go out there and and then we have things like increase the risk take a bigger chance step into the next level we believe you can do that and now that you've got this training you can believe in yourself so step out there inspire them to take on that leadership role in their own life and the lives of others and then because we've we've done the training which is tends to be a general um, I'm going to create a word, impartation. We've imparted this knowledge. We've imparted this skill. So what would the verb be, you know, be the, or the, the, the noun be? Impartation, I like. Let's use it. It'll end up in the dictionary sooner or later. Uh, then um, we end up uh, uh, saying, like, you know the bulk of it because we did that during the training. Now we got to fine-tune things. And that's where performance coaching comes into play. So performance coaching does have a lot to do with working with someone's mindset, but performance coaching adds that element of exercising specific skills uh, so that they can, you know, successfully apply that or, as I said, just fine tuning, whatever that is. Uh, there are a couple of uh, programs we've developed in the world of tension management that tend to be for the individual. The accountable self is uh, one of those, and uh, this is all tension management applied to that as people that are certified in any of our ChangeWorks programs are all welcome to uh, go through the accountable self. And, uh, you know, it's all just part of it. So uh, we, we call that an enrichment program. But nevertheless, the accountable self has a tagline. And that tagline is about conquering the 80% the, the, uh, the existence. It's about getting you the rest of the way there, becoming a finisher in a world of starters. These are our taglines for, for that program. 
So it's all about, we get it. What you already have has gotten you most of the way to the finish line on most of the things that you want to do. Well, let's be a finisher in a world of starters. That's where this idea about performance coaching comes into play to get you from that intention into that engagement, getting that engagement very well focused so that execution actually occurs. So uh, that's, that's, again, as Dave just pointed out, moving people down and out. Other thoughts, comments about uh, using those uh, primary and secondary change grid maneuvers, down grid and out grid as a solutions approach? No. Okay, so let's look at the other thing. That's we also will move people up grid and out grid. And perhaps you find yourselves doing even more of this. Usually the people that focus on upgrid and outgrid maneuvers tend to be uh, more of the managerial types. Um, and I, I'm saying that because you have to think about what is the mindset of someone who reaches out and engages a coach and is more than willing to, to uh, uh, make that investment. Generally, it's because they have some sort of an upgrade issue because, again, people pay attention where they find their tension. So generally, people initiate a coaching relationship because they have some sort of problem, crisis, whatever they're trying to, uh, to uh, um, resolve. They've got some sort of, maybe it's just a, a, a less uh, traumatic problem, but a problem they're trying to work their way through. They have some sort of an opportunity they're trying to seize. Um, they've got some sort of you know, need they're trying to meet. There are some upgrade energies that have compelled the person to seek out and secure uh, the services of someone like, like you. And so that's, that tends to be it. So that's why I said we do a great deal of downgrid and outgrid maneuvers at the beginning stages of things. But a lot of you um, are executive coaches. And very often your client, that's in air quotes for those of you who can't see through the internet, um, those, uh, those clients are actually the executives or HR who has hired you to work with someone else on the team that they're trying to somehow or another develop. Well, that person could very easily be downgrid, and they could be down in lower power, power apathy, maybe even apathy. And your work is to take them to a new level, to help them awaken some sort of mission, vision, purpose, drive, or whatever, to, to uh, get them to step in to whatever that role is that the people who are actually hiring you envision for this person. Uh, hopefully, they want to do that. But all of you have been doing this kind of work, I'm sure, long enough that you've had your fair share of people who were just, you know, lumps. They didn't really want to do much of anything. Nevertheless, oh, look, we have to go through coaching. So am I right? You guys have all had some sort of an experience where the uh, level of enthusiasm for the work you're there to do isn't quite as high as one might have hoped for. Yeah I, yeah, I think you do run into that with executive coaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Again, these are not people who actively sought you out. Um, again, who's got the tension? It's the executives or the HR department, whoever actually hired you. They're the ones with the productive tension. That doesn't guarantee that the person you're assigned to work with has got the productive tension. And so um, in those particular situations, you end up doing a lot more upgrid and outgrid work. And so the upgrid maneuvers again, so again, you got a picture, you got this person down in power app, the app, the wherever, and you're doing some upgrade, increase standards, change the task, awaken some emotions, boost some accountability, help them find that mission, vision, purpose. Uh, remember, we said that plotting down grid represents untapped potential. And so helping that person to see a new level for themselves, a new definition, uh, all of this will hopefully move someone's level of tension upgrade. I would say to you that if you're working with someone and you do a good job of upgrade maneuvers, that's no guarantee they're going to move. There are people who are downgrid, who are completely and totally happy downgrid, and no matter what you say or do inside of these things, as we joked about a couple of weeks ago, you could pull a weapon on someone, that would move them upgrid. But it doesn't move them upgrid about their life's purpose, it just moves them upgrid about survival in that moment. So <laughs> even that's not really changing uh, what you were there to, to work with. So. So just kind of know that there are people out there, and actually I would even say to you that for all of us, there exists a certain 
set of changes that other people might want us to make that we have no interest in making no matter how much energy they put in increasing standards, changing the task, awakening emotions, or boosting accountability. We're just not a willing participant. And um, sometimes that's what's going to end up running the show. So, but let's talk about a, a more workable situation. You've got someone who's downgrade. They've become rather um, content, ambivalent, uh, perhaps even a bit disengaged in what's going on. And now you come along, increase standards, change tasks, awaken emotions, boost accountability. Let's get them reengaged. Get them back into how about have an intention. Even if it's a downgrade intention, at least have one. And then from that downgrade intention, let's move them up to a little bit of downgrade engagement. At least they're engaged. It doesn't have the the, the, the passion, enthusiasm, the outward um, um, reactions that are, are uh, responses that someone who's upgrade has, but nevertheless, they're at least engaged. They're doing the work. So let's, let's do that. We move them upgrade. Now, as we are increasing those standards, changing the task, awakening emotions, boosting accountability, we may also throw in some outgrid maneuvers. We might talk about, well, now that, you know, we've resurrected your enthusiasm for the work that needs to be done. We have this project let's, uh, that, that's going to be a stretch. Let's appeal to their ego. We're doing this because we know you can do it. You're the one that we've always known, and we've known you for years and years. You've, you've been an employee here forever and then some. We know that you have this talent set. We know that you've done this. So we're kind of appealing to their ego a little bit. We're, we're inspiring through our leadership to try to get back into that leader role themselves. So, so, you know, kick, kick that back into high gear. And uh, for them, we may very well want to provide not only performance coaching, but other types of coaching as well, because there's a lot of mindset issues that exist down grid that could serve as roadblocks to someone moving back up into active growth mode. Remember, there's not a whole lot of growth that happens down grid. There's a lot of existing. There's a lot of going through the motions. There's a lot of that autopilot kind of stuff. But that's not like personal growth. That certainly isn't business growth. And so if we can do something to change that mindset or work with that mindset, we can also move them uh, more effectively out grid as well. So again, um, we very often will move people down grid and out grid. We also very frequently move people up grid and out grid. Um, and so we can do those maneuvers in succession or in uh, combination with, uh, you know, to, to uh, as a simultaneous kind of delivery. Um, and they both work well. Anyone have any thoughts about moving people up and out? Yeah, just in general, I think too, um, even, even, uh, coaching clients that aren't executive coaching clients, they, they may have come to us uh, with some upgrade issues, but they also have some downgrade activities as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I find even then you'll use these upgrade maneuvers, especially, you know, one of the things you've said T that I think is pretty insightful uh, about looking at these things is that the assets you find downgrade can help you solve the problems that you find upgrade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's and, a lot of things, you know, think about this. Downgrid is a warehouse of experiences. It's a warehouse of untapped potential. Because look, perceived ability is very high. The challenge is very low. So what's in this pile of stuff downgrid? It's all those successes, all those experiences, all that knowledge, all that skill. And it's just sitting there in a pile so, as Dave just said, very often the remedy to upgrade issues, these problems, challenges, untapped opportunities, uh, can be dealt with very effectively if we can just restore the resources that are all around your ankles, figuratively speaking. <laughs> you know, pick it up, yeah. people. Put it back into use. It's there. So, uh, yeah, yeah, this whole idea of playing a bigger game, which I know a lot of coaches are, are involved with. Yep. Uh, you know, it, with their clients, you know, it's all about up and out, right? So. Absolutely. It's all about up and out, all about, it. you know, years ago, the big theme was finding greatness, your personal greatness. And so the label we'll use for that, for the result of those movements may change over the years, but tension management has been around forever. 
And uh, so, uh, you know, we, we don't need modern thinking to, to go like, okay, now we start moving people up and out. Now it's been happening forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. We're just kind of changing the language that goes along with it, but the behaviors have been there forever. And so. so now um, I didn't talk about moving people down and in, and I don't talk about moving people up and in because quite candidly, the um, situations where you would do such a thing are so limited that off the top of my head, I can't even think of one. Uh, so we did talk about why we do in-grid maneuvers is because people tend to be in the uh, people who are in the out-grid danger zone um, tend to be burning bridges and damaging relationships and all kinds of other stuff that really nobody wants to be around and I'm sure they're not even being uh, truly happy with themselves that they spoke their heart's truth so We'll do in-grid maneuvers uh, to uh, get someone out of the danger zone. But can you think of any time why I would ever want to take an engaged person, a fully engaged person, and move them away from that into intention instead? Maybe to formulate a new intention because the current intention isn't really serving them, but that's got to be a pretty rare thing. And how about moving someone from, from intention back to in-grid to awareness? Well, maybe I need to do that if they've just kind of missing something altogether, but th this is not a very common thing to do. Do you need to know the skill set? Absolutely. Should you plan on using them routinely? I don't think so. I just don't think so. Dave, I think you got a query coming in there. there someone, asked, someone asked, should we be on a different slide? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, well, well, we would be, no, really. Yeah, we'll get to an in-grid. Reducing risk, appeal to nobler motives, review boundaries, increase introspection. These were the in-grid maneuvers. And if we do have someone who is out in the out-grid danger zone, we do need to get that risk situation taken care of. Appeal to their nobler motives by reminding them there are people involved and impacted by what they're doing. Reviewing those boundaries because, again, people that live in the out-grid danger zone. Oh, one thing I do want to say, Dave emphasized something, and I want to make sure that emphasis was heard. We, uh, while we, in a rather sloppy, perhaps, um, a uh, careless kind of way, we do talk about moving people around the change grid. The truth is we really are moving activities around on the change grid. So we, we, you know, because we're talking about a specific activity, the person is moving up grid and out grid as far as that activity is concerned, or maybe they're moving down grid and out grid because, uh, around that particular activity. But we do find ourselves in the laziness of speech talking about moving the person, but specifically we're moving the person as far as that activity is concerned. Uh, to that. Now, there is a residual impact. If we do move you upgrade and outgrade about, uh, about one activity, it's not at all uncommon for a whole lot of other things to get pulled in that direction along with it. Likewise, if, I, if you get uh, moved downgrade and outgrade, calm down and intentional about one thing that's going on, there may be some other, you know, tag alongs, but we really are moving people specific to an activity around on the change grid, as opposed to moving the human uh, from one spot on the change grid to another. Um, so just a okay. little fun in there. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Daniel has his hand raised. I'm going to unmute him. Okay. I see the question about when would you apply this in grid um, maneuver mm -hmm. process with yep. people. I yep. think um, uh, the example that I would offer being a veteran myself is with people like myself, veterans. Uh, we are trained at a very high level. We are trained to use our power, our capacity to, uh, to use power. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's overused mm -hmm. uh, with, with little concern to the people who it affects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and this is this is uh, an area where I, I would suggest it would be very yeah I, I think that's a good observation because I think the people who for whatever reasons have been saddled with a tremendous amount of responsibility and often a tremendous amount of authority to go along with that responsibility get so accustomed to having to operate from that uh, that mindset that they forget that the circumstances have changed. Uh, 
and the environments that they were in where that level of responsibility and authority and responsiveness was so necessary are not the circumstances of this particular moment or a particular situation, in which case that level of responsibility, responsiveness, authority, uh, exercising the that amount of power, as you put it, is not only no longer necessary, but it's no longer appropriate and can actually be counterproductive uh, to whatever the situation happens to be. So uh, I think that when we do the discussion session about how coaches specifically use these concepts with their clients, one subject that I think would be very interesting to chat about is, uh, is, is Daniel's area of expertise, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. And so coaching people who are dealing with, uh, with that aftermath. Um, so um, some of it is about lowering tension because of all the stress associated that, but a lot of it, as Daniel pointed out, has to do with moving those individuals further in grid. Now, that does tend to be a very specialized area of work, very often work that is done by people that have different um, uh, licenses and designations than um, most of the coaches that we are training on this program would have, um, you know, more of the therapeutic kind of community. Um, the, so, uh, nevertheless, there are elements of this that I think are uh, – um, likely to be encountered by all of us as we work with the variety because there are so many veterans and there are so many people who have had to deal with that kind of uh, chapter in, in life. And, you know, we all certainly appreciate the sacrifices that they made. And there is this aftermath that we also have to make sure we do our best to, uh, to support and help. If I may, T. Yep. Uh, to carry that on, I, I think that, uh, you know, anyone who has undergone some trauma, some form of, of uh, pain that they've had to rise above, that they've had to push through, um, we often find, you know, that, that people who, who um, let's say, for, for example, were smokers, right, or alcoholics, mm -hmm. uh, who have gone through that then become very uh, empowered to invoke you know, their, their thoughts and, and beliefs on others, mm -hmm. which is very much like the vets. It's, it's, uh, there's, there's an entire range. And I think that a lot of those people that you're talking about that have letters after their names, uh, would be very well served by learning this system. Excellent. Well, we welcome them to join in. That's great. Um, okay. So, uh, let's move on to, See, our, yeah, go ahead. I'm Nick. sorry. Kathy has a comment too. Oh, go right ahead. My comment was that I think that the upgrid and ingrid maneuver would be in a, in a very specialized case be used to develop to support spiritual growth. If someone has the intention um, to move into a place of power around spiritual growth and upward and inward focus or, or maneuver could, could put them in that place of intention from which brings us to the PowerPoint con conversation from which they can then move outward and take action. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so let's take a look at those, at those PowerPoint maneuvers and then we can build on what Kathy just said because the, here's here's going to be the big, the big question. So this is the, the kind of hidden agenda in the world of PowerPoint maneuvers. If I want to move someone to the exact center of the change grid, let me just go ahead and go there. If I want to move someone to the exact center of the change grid, I could do it by using upgrid maneuvers or downgrid maneuvers or ingrid maneuvers or outgrid maneuvers, depending on where they're starting from, uh, they may very well have to go through the center of the grid as we move them. So I could use any of those maneuvers or combination of maneuvers to get you to the exact center of the change grid. Luckily, I have another option, and that is these PowerPoint maneuvers. And so here's what I think is one of the, the, the most useful things for coaches in particular uh, to use with their clients. And uh, certainly, as we go through this, I want you all to think about how you can use this in your personal lives as well. So PowerPoint maneuvers. 
to understand PowerPoint maneuvers, let's revisit what happens at the exact center of the change grid. And again, our, uh, our, the, the truth of PowerPoint maneuvers, and I say it as a joke, but I just want to re remind everyone why they're called PowerPoint. It's because it moves you to, this, to the center. Of the, it's got nothing to do with Microsoft. So we've been using this term a lot longer than Microsoft has been in business. So the center of the change grid, what is so magical about the center of the change grid? <clears throat> the center of the change grid is a place of total balance. It's a place where your perceived level of ability is moderate and the perceived level of challenge is also moderate. So you are neither ignorant nor, nor brilliant. You are neither uh, stressed out or in apathy. You are neither overly driven or overly uh, hesitant. You are, you're just in the middle of all of it. And something very interesting happens when you're in the middle of everything. When you're in the middle of everything, there is a calm. So there was just a, a big hurricane. We know what happens in the center of a hurricane. The eye of a hurricane is calm. And so all around you, if you put yourself in the center of the change grid, you're in the center of the hurricane. Outgrid is one of the ways a hurricane expresses. There's upgrid, there's ingrid, there's downgrid. There's all of these extremes that could be happening in that whole hurricane of life. But in the exact center of that hurricane, there is calmness, there is peacefulness, there is silence. And that's what happens in the exact center of the change grid. We describe the center of the change grid as having a few uh, phrases from Native American teachings that do kind of encapsulate that experience. So when you're in the center of the change grid, we describe you as being in the world, but not of it. We say that you let the winds of heaven dance around you. We say that you understand that one cannot pull the, pull the, push the river nor pull the sprout. So the center of the change grid is a place of allowing things to be as they are. Uh, we do talk about in the, in the center of the change grid, it's a great place for a professional to operate from because in the center of the change grid at the PowerPoint, you are very natural at practicing what we refer to as the art of caring detachment. So when you're in the center of the change grid, you can care so deeply about everyone, about all of your clients, about all their issues, but you are detached from it. You recognize it is not you who is experiencing this stuff. It's not you that is going through this pain or this trauma or whatever. When a professional, instead of detaches themselves from these, uh, these feelings and these situations, they allow themselves to become attached to them now we've got the professional who is feeling that pain, the professional who is uh, experiencing whatever that, that experience happens to be. And you have to ask yourself, if you get attached to something, are you going to be as objective? Are you going to be as useful? Uh, so again, we have whole discussions in the world of coaching and other human development uh, uh, disciplines about um, ethically, where should you be? What should your mindset be about having your own agenda or not having an agenda? About keeping your channels clear and clean so that you can be whatever the, the situation at hand uh, best, uh, is best served by you being. So um, do we all, all understand what this center of the change grid is really um, all about? Yes, thoughts? Have I overwhelmed people's <laughs> thoughts about the I'm not, I'm not seeing any comments get, come through. But. Okay, yeah, yeah. But we all, we all get this moment. Now, when you are personally at the center of the change grid, it's almost like you are, I, I often describe it as being you are standing on a very small island, a few steps, and you might no longer be on the island. You might be in the water. And so this is a little island. There's a stream that's flowing along the heart line. And the further out grid you go, the, 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 it goes from being a trickle of water to being a steady flow to being a torrent of, of water movement very far out grid. Or, and so there, there is this, this idea about being at a resting place. Uh, some have described it as music on hold. You are just in this centered place where you are very observant of what's going on, but you are not really even formulating an intention around it. If you look at the um, 
at the engagement ring level of the change grid, um, there is uh, only the slightest amount of intention that even happens in uh, when someone is at the PowerPoint. And so it, it is a place of detachment. Now, it's really interesting uh, how the human experience and the PowerPoint interplay it's interesting how many things people do or uh, to, to move themselves to the center of the change grid who say that's really important to them. And so we do things like meditation. We do things like yoga. We do talk about a lot of things that 20, 30 years ago would have been just referred to as new age practices, things that we're trying to get you to move to this centered, peaceful, you know, detached sort of place. Um, and certainly um, anyone who has a rich spiritual uh, life, a, a life of faith, a, a life of religious commitments, things like that, would very much find themselves seeking out this centered experience, this place of peace and harmony and balance. Now, unfortunately, um, if you want to become metaphysical about this for just a second, that centered experience, as wonderful as it can be, is not compatible with the human experience. The human experience is all about living. And when you are out there actually living, you are taking risks. You are responding to upgrid issues. You are becoming other-oriented, more in-grid. You are experiencing boredom and complacency. All these things that happen, upgrid, outgrid, downgrid, and ingrid, um, are all part of living life. Um, but sometimes living life is, um, is exhausting and disruptive. And we need to say, like, I just got to take a vacation. I've got to retreat from all this. I need to recharge my batteries. I need to get back to that balanced, centered place. And I know that once I'm there, I can take a pause and I can decide how to actually go out there and deal with life. And then I get back out, grid up, grid down, grid or in grid, and do whatever it is that actually needs to be done. Uh, if you guys go through the uh, enrichment uh, programs on the uh, change grid layer by layer, you'll learn about radial trends on the change grid. So these are things that are going to emanate from the PowerPoint in circles going away from the change grid. And so what happens when you are uh, centered? What happens when you have a one degree deviation from center, a two degree deviation, a three degree deviation? What happens when you are actually moving away from the PowerPoint? And so uh, now I'll give you another example of the incompatibility of the PowerPoint with life as we know it. So how many of you have had an experience, a time in life when you just said, I just need to get away from it all, you know, all this stuff that's going on, all this stuff I'm dealing with, I just really need, you know, wouldn't it be great if I could just go to a tropical island and just sit on the beach and read a book? Oh, that would be the life. Why can't I just, let's just go do that. And so you decide to actually go on a vacation. And you go to that tropical island and you sit on that beach and you've got that book and on day one you're going, this is perfect. I could do this every day for the rest of my life. And then day two you get out there and you're going like, ah, oh, this is so beautiful and, and et cetera. But by day three you're kind of going like, is there like nothing else to do on this island? I mean, after your batteries are recharged, after you've been centered and restored, you start to find an uneasiness in that peace, in that harmony. Um, very, very few people, and I think we'd have to probably look for, you know, you know, monks or, you know, Buddhist monks at some sort of, you know, retreat somewhere or whatever. Very few people are capable of moving themselves to the center of the change grid and remaining there for extended periods of time before finding that a disturbing place as well. So uh, I'll throw that out as a question. How many of you have ever found yourself in that situation where there's nothing really negative going on? Everything's perfectly fine and everyone's, you know, content and peaceful and harmonious. And that starts to feel a little weird. So am I right? So you guys, have you experienced that or worked with someone who's experienced that? The uneasiness of easy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Vacation's right. a great example. You know, right, it's right. like, uh, you know, I, if I go for two weeks, that could be awesome. But after that, it's like, oh, 
I want to get back to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's go do <laughs> like, something. Yeah. Let's do something productive, right? So. Right. So it talks about, you know, we talk about that things that uh, uh, there's an uneasiness that comes after a prolonged period of things being easy. There is a disturbance to the peace that peace, ex peace uh, um, eventually evolves into. And so this is my whole thing. The PowerPoint is a place that serves us really well, but it is uh, not really the destination. Now, if I was the kind of counselor, coach, um, religious leader, whatever my, my, my role happens to be, and my whole goal, my whole business was to help you get good at getting centered. So I was teaching you meditation. I was a yoga instructor. I was working with you through any of these countless modalities that are designed to help you find that centered place. Okay, well, that's my job. My, my job is to help you get centered. And now that I've taught you how to get centered and I'm giving you opportunities to recenter yourself, I mean, I take yoga lessons seven or eight times a week. So I, I completely get it. Um, that's their role. But most of you are, are doing the kinds of coaching uh, work that isn't about moving someone to center and staying there. It's about now let's go do something. And so I want you to understand the PowerPoint maneuvers because of how quickly they can produce a specific um, environment and then it'll be easier for you to do the work that really uh, needs to be done. Uh, let's see, Daniel, I think has a question or a comment. So, mm -hmm. uh, yep. You bet. Uh, just listening to, to all that you were saying, T, and thinking about uh, my own experience and one of those being in a flotation tank. Mm, yeah. And one of the things that we know about flotation tanks is at first it's comfortable, but after a while, uh, the mind is so accustomed to noise mm -hmm. and so right. accustomed to dealing with things and not accustomed to a lack of sensory input. All right. And so the more we become, you know, uh, comfortable on that beach, the more we're going to move toward the discomfort of those externals, uh, which are internal in our mind, in our mm -hmm. subconscious or wherever they're coming from boiling up and uh, with any luck, you know, they're, they're inspiring us to be more creative, more productive, more innovative. Uh, and if not with luck, then they can take us in quite another direction. Absolutely. So it's Absolutely. very important to, to be aware of what's around you from the center and to be, to be aware of I'm moving in that direction. I feel it pulling me in that direction. What's that about? Yep. 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 And, exactly. and to be able to be able to maintain that center just as the as as the uh, you know martial artist uh, maintains the center and moves out in any direction to strike and return to center, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that that for me is uh, is a warrior's path. Yep. That's wonderful. Thank you for for uh, including that. the The nice thing about what Daniel has just described is it says that the centered experience is useful for a given amount of time. And we will know when its time is over because we start to have thoughts that replace it. I'm reminded of a study that was done, and you guys can look this up if you find it interesting, about how long can the average um, human being uh, tolerate a soundproof environment? And so and that was all it was. They put you in a soundproof booth and went like, how long is it going to be before you find it maddening to be in there? And um, it was uh, really a, a, an experience. When I was in college, I went through an experience on sensory deprivation. There weren't flotation tanks at the, t at the time, sadly. But we would uh, have an experience where we would go like, what would it be like to not have a sense of sight for 24 hours? What would it, not, it would be like to not have um, a, a, the sense of hearing for 24 hours? And what was most interesting about it was that you do learn a lot from depriving yourself of a particular sense. Uh, but at a, after a certain point of time, it really does become quite maddening. And this was actually done as part of a psychology class that we took that was trying to help us appreciate the difference between someone uh, psychologically, the, the issues that someone who is born without the use of a particular sense versus the person who loses that sense. 
So someone who becomes blind later in life or becomes deaf later in life has have a very different experience of that loss of that sensory input than someone who never had it to begin with. And that, 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 that issue that was dealt with was it becomes um, a, a bit of madness until the person learns to actually adjust and cope with whatever's going on. So I forget what the amount of time is you can spend in the soundproof booth, but I promise you it's not even hours. Uh, at a certain point in the soundproof booth, your heartbeat becomes deafening. So uh, it's kind of crazy, but anyway, our point is, and I, I'm, I'm glad we're having this interesting dialogue, but I want to I finish off the PowerPoint maneuvers. Um, the PowerPoint is a place of centered, and very often we need to get there because from that place, we can more objectively observe, understand, and make decisions about what to do next. So here's the challenge with PowerPoint maneuvers. There is no set of them that's been pre-mapped. I can't say, like I said, for up, up, grid, down, grid, in, grid, and out, grid. Here are the four things you can do to move that direction. No. But what I can say to you is that every single person uh, you will work with and every single one of you already have your own set of PowerPoint maneuvers. So all of you know that there are certain things that you can do anytime you choose to do them that will move you to the exact center of the change grid. But they're different for different people. And so it's very important that you understand, recognize and understand what your personal PowerPoint maneuvers are. So what are the kinds of things that center you? Um, is it something that is on the uh, spiritual side of things? Is it about meditating? Is it about praying? Is it something that's more physical? So we talk about tension is about physical, emotional and intellectual activity. Is it about going for a walk in nature? Is it a bubble bath? Is it about talking to someone that you love? Um, I don't know what your PowerPoint maneuvers are. You may not even be aware of them, but going on a search for what your personal PowerPoint maneuvers are is a very, very useful pursuit and a very powerful um, asset to have at your command. Because once you know what they are, anytime you're feeling out of sorts, or before you decide to make any sort of a, of a significant decision or take any kind of significant action, you can just say to yourself, before I do that, I'm going to center myself. Is that three deep breaths? Is that a five minutes of meditation? Is that, I don't know, but whatever it is, it's very important that you uh, are aware of it so that you can elect to do it. Now, you don't just have one PowerPoint maneuver. All of you probably have a couple of dozen of them if you put your mind to it. And some of them are going to be very handy and some of them aren't. So, for example, I do find it very odd if I'm sitting in a terminal at an airport before we're getting on the plane and someone decides to center themselves by doing yoga in the middle of the waiting area. I think that's a little bit odd. So maybe we could say, while that's a great PowerPoint maneuver for that person, were there others that might be a little less peculiar to be exhibiting in public? So it's nice that you have at your disposal some very quiet, quiet, private sorts of PowerPoint maneuvers you can do. And given other circumstances, there are some things that are far more outward and noticeable you can do. <laughs> so, uh, so for example, uh, Linda is very, my wife Linda, is very, very active in the world of Tai Chi and Qigong. And so one of the things that they do is this thing called shaking the nine gates, which is basically about standing and shaking all of your limbs and bouncing up and down for a good long while. And uh, it's very effective at centering you, getting all of your energy flowing. All, it's all very, very, thin. it would be very odd to witness someone doing that, getting aboard an airplane. I would think they're nervous. So, uh, so I bring this up only to say that it's important to know a range of PowerPoint maneuvers that work for you so that you can choose an appropriate one given whatever the circumstances you are in. Also, some can be done inside of a matter of a few, few seconds, maybe a few minutes, and others might need a much longer period of time. 
for them to work. So you just want to know what they are. So your homework, if you will, is to determine what your personal PowerPoint maneuvers happen to be. Now, when it comes to working with your clients, I think it's also very valuable for you to help your clients to identify their PowerPoint maneuvers. Because once you've done that, when it comes to managing tension, you can say, let's start by centering. So before we are here to talk about every, anything and everything, like, the, you know, they walk in and they're very far up grid. And um, uh, you go like, all right, well, you know, you've been working with them for a while. You recognize their upgrade. You can share with them their upgrade. Let's say, like, before we start getting into the details of what's got you very far upgrade, let's do something centering. So let's take those deep breaths. Let's pause for a moment. Let's, whatever it is that you know their, uh, their uh, PowerPoint maneuver happens to be, inside of a very short amount of time, with little or no dialogue required whatsoever, you can move that person to this place of caring detachment. You can move this person to this place where they let the winds of heaven dance around them, where they are in the world but not of it. And from that place, they may very well be able to um, um, understand, explore, whatever the situation is from a very different mindset and that could help them to achieve their outcome in a more uh, quick and efficient sort of way. So again, just in summary, to move someone to the center of the change grid, I could do the upgrid, downgrid, ingrid, or outgrid maneuvers that would ultimately move them there. Or I could just say, and perhaps far more quickly, get them to the center of the change grid uh, using PowerPoint maneuvers and then let the work begin. Um, so thoughts about PowerPoint maneuvers, about using this as a centering strategy before we get into the work of moving someone up, grid, out, grid, down, grid, whatever. Thoughts? Daniel has his hand up. So go ahead, Daniel. You can unmute yourself. You bet, T. I, I really appreciate it. I was about to raise my hand and say, oh, yeah, and start your clients off. Get them there because they're going to make better decisions. So I really appreciate you going there with that because getting people into the best decision-making place mm -hmm so that they can go out from there is, is so dynamically important to a good start yeah. and a good direction. Absolutely. And, you know, again, we can look at, at a lot of, of uh, more of the formal kinds of tension management. Well, they don't know it's tension management, but these formal kind of centering experiences. Like, for example, if you take yoga, every yoga class begins by pulling down the heavens. And so there's going to be this ritual kind of gesture that gets done to get you where you are. There's always... In our, in our yoga school, there's always five minutes of deep breathing that's being done. It's all to get us in the right mind space. If you go, uh, if you're part of a, of a, of a religious uh, organization, maybe everything that you do begins with a prayer. So there's a lot of things that people will do as part of this centering experience. And they don't even know that what they're doing is centering. But that is exactly what they're doing. And once you're in that centered spot, now we're all together. We've all kind of retreated from the world and the issues of the world so that we can now begin whatever the purpose of getting together is really all about. That's what it's all about. So what is the centering thing that you can do with your clients? Now, again, you can't use your PowerPoint maneuvers to move them to their PowerPoint. We, we do have to understand. So it's not something you could easily do on the first session with a client. But certainly, um, it's something that after you deal with whatever the initial issue was that brought them to uh, engage your services, then uh, you can do that. Now, one last thing I'd like to share about this, and then I see we have quite a few comments there, a lot of comments, in fact, um, is that those of you that are doing outreach work to find more clients, um, I think it could be a very useful thing for you to do, and you're welcome to do this. Do a little bit of a speaking engagement and talk about the different levels of tension and talk about that, that what life is really all about is tension management and talk about some of the upgrade maneuvers and downgrade maneuvers and leave them with that whole idea about PowerPoint maneuvers. 
it takes time to properly teach and get good at upgrade, downgrade, ingrid, and outgrid maneuvers. There, there's, there's technique there, there's work, the, there's learning that has to happen. But PowerPoint maneuvers are something you all have already mastered. You just may not recognize that whatever those behaviors are, are your PowerPoint maneuvers. Creating that awareness is all that it takes to get people to uh, have the, uh, the PowerPoint maneuvers readily available to them. So that, that you can do inside of a very uh, quick little uh, you know, speaking engagement with a, an audience to help them know who you are and what you do. So give them something of value. Okay, Daniel, uh, and I'm uh, sorry, Dan, uh, I see Daniel, but um, uh, Dave, I see there are all these questions, comments. So any of those anyone want to share before we're done? Uh, yeah, John just says, would it make sense just to ask your clients what their centering maneuvers are? Well, absolutely. I mean, that's a great way to get to it. What do you do to center yourself? Now, again, is that going to be the first question we ask when we're first meeting with a client? Don't know. That'd be a very interesting session. But the sooner you know it, the better. And so during the discussion sessions, maybe that would be a good way for, for a good uh, topic to bring up to the faculty and just say, so how do you elicit from your clients what their PowerPoint maneuvers may be. So how do you go about centering yourself? How do you go about finding peace and balance? How do you best take care of you uh, can also um, uh, result in them sharing with you what their PowerPoint maneuvers happen to be. We just need to write them down so that we, we know them. And we, we, you know, we, we talk about this in a business setting as well with managers working with employees. Very important that every manager knows every employee's PowerPoint maneuvers. So that when that employee gets out of sorts, you could just say, you know, go do this. Go for a quick walk around the building. You need to go for a coffee break. You know, whatever it is. I don't know what their PowerPoint maneuvers are, but once I do know them, now I can use them for a great benefit to everyone involved. Um, other comments, other thoughts? I think that's it. Okay, then uh, for all of you, your next uh, step is to participate in the discussion session around PowerPoint maneuvers. And uh, so uh, uh, these are uh, uh, recorded sessions with the faculty members, and uh, you'll just need to look at the resource page to be able to do that. Um, uh, also, a reminder for everyone on Wednesdays uh, at uh, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, we do have the dialogue sessions that are going on, so here, please feel free to join us for those. Um, starting next time, we'll be doing Lesson 8, which is the final lesson, and this is putting it all together. So now that you've learned all the component pieces of the ChangeWorks uh, system coaching approach, we want to uh, show you how you put all those pieces together. With that, thank you all very much for joining in. Take care. Bye for now.